angels waging war in the unseen realm. Global events fulfilling biblical prophecy. Eternal life. What lies beyond mortality? From analyzing the paranormal from a biblical worldview to the discussion of cutting edge science and technology, conspiracy, discovery, special investigative reports. Unafraid to explore the challenging issues facing humanity. Welcome to another edition of Skywatch TV. It's difficult to fight a war, especially a spiritual war, when you don't know the enemy. Welcome to Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert. Joining me in studio this week, the host of Into the Multiverse, one of the web exclusive programs from Skywatch TV, and the author of Cherub and Chariots and Quantum Creation, Josh Peck. Hey, Derek. And the scholar in residence from Logos Bible Software, the author of several books we recommend for your reference library. I dare you not to bore me with the Bible. Supernatural, what the Bible teaches about the unseen world and why it matters, and the unseen realm recovering the uh, supernatural worldview of the Bible. Dr. Michael Heiser. Mike, right, welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Demons, where do they come from? <laughs> and why are they th the same as fallen angels? <laughs> well, you know, this is one of those topics I get in trouble for, uh, <laughs> but I'm unrepentant. Uh, I don't think demons are fallen angels. I don't think they're the same. And I think it's, it's pretty easy to kind of demonstrate that. I mean, the, the, the assumption is we read about demons in the Gospels. And so, you know, we think, well, they had to come from somewhere, even though Scripture never actually tells us specifically where they come from. And so people will go back in the Old Testament and they'll read about what happens in the garden. If they're in the typical Christian church, they probably don't read about what happens in Genesis <laughs> 6, 1 through 4. Mm -hmm. And who knows what, what they're thinking of when they get to the Babel story. But so they, they tend to gravitate toward Genesis 3 and they assume, okay, well, if you have, you know, the, the serpent here and he's a bad guy and we have demons, plural, in the New Testament, they must have all rebelled at the same time or he's the leader and took a bunch with them. And there isn't a single biblical passage that teaches any of that. Mm-hmm. And people are shocked when you actually say that. And they'll think, well, what about the third of the angels thing? And well, if you go look that up in Revelation 12, it's the only place that language is used. Mm -hmm. That's associated with the first coming of Jesus. Right, right. Not, so it didn't happen until his right, birth. Not creation. Mm -hmm. You know, you have this war in heaven over the coming of the Messiah and all that stuff, which is, you know, pretty important mm -hmm. when it comes to the whole battle of good and evil. Is the Messiah going to be here or not? You know, is he going to survive or not? And trying to kill him off and whatnot. But you have this gap between the figures you see in the Gospels and, like, where did they come from? Now, in your English Bibles, you get the word demons, typically in English Bibles, occurring twice in the Old Testament. And they're never with respect to a fall. Mm -hmm. Deuteronomy 32, 17 is probably one that's going to, you know, show up that way. And then there's a reference in Psalms. And the term is shadim. Mm -hmm. In Deuteronomy 32, 17, the shadim are the gods, again, it turns out because of tracking through Deuteronomy, they're the gods of the other nations that Israelites were seduced to worship, and they're bad guys. But it doesn't actually describe some sort of primeval fall. There's no such thing as exorcism in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. I mean, you never have any precedent for this. And here, here's a kicker. Why did Jews of, of the day expect the Messiah to be someone who exercised demons? There's nothing like this in the Old Testament. It's never given as part of the profile of the hmm. Messiah for mm -hmm. David. You have all these disconnects. Now, all of that to us leaves us in a quandary. And we just sort of ignore the fact that there aren't any real connections and we just kind of make them. So demons are fallen angels. If you asked a Jew the same question, they actually would have a very clear answer. <laughs> They would say, well, that's, that's pretty easy, Mike. Demons are the disembodied spirits of dead Nephilim. Mm -hmm. And you go like, holy cow, that's crazy town. I mean, where, where did you get that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, where you get it, again, is the Jewish literature of the intertestamental period that, again, is catching on, latching on, connecting back into the original context of Genesis 6, 1 through 4. That's where they get it. They don't invent it. Mm -hmm. They're just aware of it because of the time and place in which they live. And they preserve it in their writings. And some of it leaks into the New Testament, Peter and Jude, that sort of thing. In the Gospels, though, 
you would, they would, a Jew would, would take you to the episodes and say, well, hey, why do you think demons possessed people? Mm -hmm. Why did they need to be re-embodied? Right? And their answer is because they were disembodied because they're disembodied spirits of the dead Nephilim. Mm -hmm. Now you say, well, okay, that, that's this intertestamental crazy stuff. It's not in the Bible and whatnot. You actually get the spirits of the giants in hell, so to speak, in the underworld, mm -hmm. in the Old Testament. Okay, you have references to that in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 32, for instance. Uh, you have uh, the, the whole rebel figures, with the, the, the Satan figure, the Lucifer figure, Helal ben Shakar. Again, he's part of this entourage that's in Sheol. You know, the, the, the shades, the, the spirits of the dead come up to meet him. Mm -hmm. and the spirits of the dead are dead Rephaim. Mm -hmm. And the Rephaim back in the Old Testament are the giants. I mean, you, you, you have these ideas connected together. It's just that they don't occur in one passage in the Old Testament, but they're all there. But in the intertestamental literature, they are all in nice condensed form and specific stories. Mm. And so Jews would have been reading that and going, oh yeah, well we, we know where the, whoever wrote Enoch, we know where he's getting that because it's these half dozen passages back here in the Old Testament. Plus we know the Mesopotamian backstory to it. Of course, hmm. this is where demons come from. That's really interesting. With, um, with demons being disembodied and, and that's the reason that you know they they want to possess people, and then it seems like the, the Bible would communicate the idea that angels, be they fallen or not, still have some sort of body. Um, how does uh, something like um, the passage where we read that Satan uh, possessed Judas, uh, how, how does that fit in? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I don't think, we're not saying that Satan would be a demon, but how, how, would, how would that fit in with? Uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm pretty traditional in, in that respect. I think that is, is sort of a, a direct possession in terms of control, not mm -hmm. like, not like I'm going to embody you and now like live in your body for the rest, you know, for a while because I just kind of like that. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't get any sense of that from the Gospels, but it, it's a manipulative control. Oh, okay. So I, I think, again, that's, that's a, a very traditional way of looking at it. I think mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a good way to look at it. It makes sense, you know, in the context and, and with what you see after that event happens. Sure. You know, you, you, you don't get any sense that it's anything more than a temporary, I'm going to use you now as a tool. <laughs> sort of situation. Mm -hmm. In our previous discussion, you've talked about the, uh, uh, the Mesopotamian origins of the watchers, the, the Apkalu, the, mm -hmm. the sort of wise men who were, uh, existed before the flood and then after the flood as um, yeah. sort of hybrid creatures in the Mesopotamian yeah. culture. Um, what sort of Mesopotamian literature origin uh, deals with demons? What do we know about demons from those sources? Yeah, there, there's actually a lot of it. There, there are whole bodies of literature that deal with exorcism and possession. Uh, okay, so, so, ex yeah. so exorcism wasn't something that was developed by the Hebrews no. after, the, uh, after the, the, the flood. It was something that existed in Mesopotamia going back prior to the or God calling out Abram and creating a new yeah, nation. You, you, have, you have a variety of rituals to deal with, again, what, what scholars would loosely call witchcraft. Uh, and, and what they mean by that is either positive spellcraft to get rid of a demonic entity. You know, in other words, what do we do in response to what we think is demonization? Or again, something even more extreme, like, like how do you get rid of them in a more permanent way? You know, there's all sorts of speculative texts about that and ceremonies and incantations. You, you actually get a lot of it. Uh, because again, you know, put yourself in the context, you know, the, for instance, stillborn babies. In Mesopotamia, that, tragedy was not treated as a medical problem. Mm -hmm. They don't know about SIDS, they don't know about X number of things, but to them they associated that with the, you know, any number of night demons. You know, Lilith w would be one of them. Mm. Uh, it goes all the way back into Mesopotamia, but the night demons come and steal the children away, steal the lives of the children and so on. So, so to cure that problem or protect the child they would, they would naturally consult not with medical doctors, they would go to scribes, they would go to the experts, the knowledge experts, the content experts, and say, hey, wait, what do we do? And they're the ones, again, who are supposed to have inherited divine knowledge, again, from the Apkalu or you know, from uh, some other you know, divine source. And they're the ones that are supposed to be, and they did, write out ritual text. Okay, here's what you do, here's what you pray, here's what you say, you know, here's this thing that you put in your house again, to protect you, you know, from the night demon, if you have a new child or something like that. Hmm. So it, there's, there's just a ton of it. 
whole, whole genre, in fact, of that kind of literature. It's, it's interesting because there's such a contrast between that and the example that Jesus shows of dealing with uh, you know, demons yeah. in the New Testament. He never appeals to any incantation. <laughs> yeah. He never quotes a higher power. Mm -hmm. He never asks permission. It's just get lost. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, literally. He, and, and Jews did that. You know, you know there, there are these passages in, in the Gospels and the Epistles about this or that Jew trying to cast out a demon and whatnot. And you know, the, the question arises, well, what, what would they have been doing? Like, and, and why couldn't the disciples do it over here? And, you know, you know, why does Jesus have to correct them and say, well, this is, you need to pray and fast and mm -hmm. whatnot. And the answer is, within Judaism itself, there was a lot of the same kind of literature. Again, things that you, would, you should do to try to cast out a demon renunciation texts and, and, and a lot of this stuff has been preserved and Jesus is like look fellas you know you, you don't need that stuff you're aligned with me I'm giving you authority you know over these these demons you, the, the problem is is you're just not prepared you don't, you're not dependent on me so that's why you need to pray and fast because I have given you the authority here to do this and I'm your example Jesus never does anything that a standard exorcist did other than get rid of a demon. I mean, you just get out of here. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's pretty much it. I don't need to appeal to a higher authority because there ain't one. I am the higher authority. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, in fact, it almost reminded me of the, uh, the, the, uh, the rituals that sp spiritists will, will use on these uh, ghost hunter shows to yeah. try to cleanse yeah. a house of negative energy yeah. or something, the same kind of thing. Um, I, you know, I, I should say, you know, I, I, I work with some people who, um, you know, on, on my podcast, we don't use their, their real names. Uh, Fern and Audrey are the names we use for them. And they, they work with uh, people who've been ritually traumatized, either satanic ritual abuse or some other you know, form of, of abuse. And their method, they, they don't use prayers of renunciation. They don't do deliverance ministry. Uh, they, in fact, they come out of deliverance ministry. Uh, because they, they have found that when you, when you try to do things that way and it doesn't work, then the victim, what they would call the survivor, is left to conclude, I did something else wrong. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. would have worked, but I, I, made a, I made a mistake again. Or, you know, th the blame comes back to them. What they actually do is, the b best way I can put it is they speak truth to lies. Mm -hmm. And we don't really care what the source of the lie is. We don't care if it's an entity. We don't care if it's a person. We don't care if it's somebody possessed or in their right mind who's just evil, who has convinced you that you deserve to have this happen to you or that God has abandoned you or that God wanted you, mm. you know, to go through this. You need to stop believing lies. And they actually use theology. And it's not just what quoting. What a concept. Right. It's not just <laughs> quoting verses. They, they're, they're very theologically astute. And they know because, again, one of them, is, is a survivor and a long term mm. survivor. They know how they know how the mind is altered and programmed to believe lies. And that's what they do. We need to convince you that, that you just don't have to believe lies anymore. And here's why. Here's here's the, the here's what here's what the Lord did for you. You need to you need to be reprogrammed theologically so that you stop believing lies. Mm. Dr. Heiser's book, The Unseen Realm, is about reading the Bible with the, the, the spiritual worldview of the men who actually wrote down the words that have been preserved for us today. We'll tell you how you can get a copy of the book. And when we come back, I want to talk about and maybe get into some speculation on um, different ranks of demons. Is it possible that some have more power than others? Is it possible that there are other supernatural entities other than demons that engage in spiritual oppression or possession? We'll talk about that when Skywatch continues. Skywatch TV continues right after this. Finally, a book that helps you make sense of the hard to understand parts of the Bible. Skywatch TV is proud to offer The Unseen Realm by ancient language and Bible scholar, Dr. Michael S. Heiser. He takes you into the world of the men who wrote the Bible under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And by understanding their worldview, you will better understand some of the weird parts of the Bible. Like, why was it so important to mention giants in the Old Testament? And why did Peter and Jude reference the angels who created them in the New Testament? The supernatural war between God and the fallen angels is real. The unseen realm helps you understand the way the apostles and prophets saw that war. 
And when you order The Unseen Realm from Skywatch TV, we will add these two books free. The Supernatural Worldview by Chris Putnam and G.H. Pember's classic, Earth's Earliest Ages. Order The Unseen Realm now by calling the number on your screen or log on to skywatchtvstore.com. Skywatch TV is more than just this weekly program. We have a number of programs that are available as web exclusives only. Skywatch Women, which is gearing up to launch officially in the fall, in a series of interviews of Skywatch Women one-on-one, -on -one, hosted by my wife and best friend, Sharon Gilbert. You also get the uh, weekly program that we host together on science and how we can view the world of science through a spiritual lens, a Christian lens, without being intimidated. And then, of course, Josh Peck tears apart fabric, the, the very <laughs> fabric of reality every week in into I, the multiverse. I do my best. Yes, <laughs> and then puts it back together all within 28 minutes and 30 seconds, and you'll find those plus the daily news updates at skywatchtv.com. Uh, Mike, about 10 years ago, you referred me to a um, deliverance minister who's since gone home to be with the Lord, and he wrote a really interesting uh, essay, which has been updated since I first read it, looks at the, the spiritual conflict, this, this direct face-to-face, -face, rubber meets the road, spiritual warfare, uh, in, in, and references the, the um, struggle between Michael and Satan that Jude writes about in his epistle, where they struggle over the body of Moses, and Michael didn't presume to make an accusation against Satan, but just said, the Lord mm -hmm. rebuke you. Mm -hmm. And th this gentleman said that they found through their research uh, that there were times when engaging a spiritual entity in the wrong way invited retribution, not just upon the person who was being oppressed or possessed, but also upon the deliverance minister and his mm -hmm. team, mm -hmm. um, leading them to conclude that there may be some cosmic legal framework that we don't really understand um, and legal rights or, or perhaps spiritual ranks, if you will, of, uh, of entities. Do we get any sense of that from the Bible? What can we conclude about the nature of the spirit realm and these entities from the text? Mm -hmm. there, there's something in, in uh, scholarship called the lawsuit genre. It's, it's actually a, a genre where people of the day, writers of the day, would have known how legal complaints and processes work, just like you know, we generally do. And the prophets especially, but you'll also see it in, in uh, wisdom literature and, and in New Testament as well. And often in divine council scenes, Psalm 82 is, is an example here, uh, this divine courtroom setting where the, the content of the passage will be structured and vocabulary will be used to telegraph to the reader that somebody's on trial here. Hmm. And so God could be the, both judge and jury, I mean, different parts of, of the play. I mean, you, you just have to sort of know what the structures and what the vocabulary are. So that there's a lot of that in there. And so there's a sense where there is a litigatory process. Hmm. Uh, there's, there's a pecking order, uh, especially in relationship yeah, to the pardon judge. The pun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pardon Thanks, Derek. The pun. <laughs> you know, that, that is, is very, it's very ancient. And I, I think that plus, and again, I'm not saying there's a one-to-one -one correlation here, but that plus some of the terminology that's used uh, lend itself to the answer that, yeah, that even though we're not explicitly told what the pecking order is, there is nevertheless a pecking order. You know, we, we began our, our, our discussion about, you know, angels not being demons. Well, look at what Paul, look at Paul's vocabulary. One of the two, you know, Old Testament references to demon was Deuteronomy 32, 17. Paul mm -hmm. quotes that passage in 1 Corinthians 10, 21 and 22 about, you know, be careful that you don't eat the meat sacrificed to idols because you don't want to be in fellowship with demons. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's quoting through that passage, he's quoting Deuteronomy 32 in several places. Hmm. So Paul does talk about demons, but look at the rest of his vocabulary. Okay. Principalities, powers, thrones, right. dominions, right. The, rulers. They're, they're all geographical dominion terms that if you trace them back through the Septuagint, Greek translation of the Old Testament, you're going to wind up in passages like Daniel 10, and you're going to wind up in passages like Deuteronomy 32, the division of the nations according to the sons of God. Hmm. So these entities are different than demons because if you think about the Old Testament, the Old Testament we're, you know, again, scattered in six different places. You have demons, the, the denizens of hell, so to speak, are the disembodied spirits of the giant clans, the Rephaim. And again, Second Temple period is big on that. They, mm -hmm. they fully develop that thought. Well, those guys aren't these other guys. Okay, the ones that are, you know, in hell, so to speak, mm -hmm. bound in chains, are either the offending sons of God of Genesis 6 
or again, their offspring who are sent back, you know, who can come and go, but the other ones are in jail down there. Well, the gods of the nations aren't down there. They're mm -hmm. never described as being down there. There's something different. So if you just pay attention to terminology, you get the idea that, okay, there's, there's these guys, there's these guys over here. And, and I personally think that even though they, they hate the same things, God and believers, mm -hmm. they aren't necessarily fighting for each other. Mm -hmm. They're free will beings that, that you know, could have a, a divided agenda here or don't like the pecking order or whatever it is. You know, Paul or, uh, Peter and Jude use the term celestial ones, mm -hmm. which is a term that in, the, in that literature is, you know, those, those writers, Peter and Jude, are linked to archangels. So in theory, Michael, okay, could have been at the same level as, you know, Satan, who is, you know, one of these, he's not a demon, Never described that way. Mm -hmm. He's a fallen, you know, son of God, a fallen Elohim. So he outranks the demons who are sort of secondary. You know, in, and I don't know if for a lot of people would not have read the portent, but I have this line in the portent where the, the villain, you know, who is, is more than a man, mm -hmm. okay, says in, in one confrontation, he says, demons are like puppies. They come when they're called. Okay. Mm. And, but I do what I want. You know, th there, there is this, this sense of hierarchy that you get from the text, even though we don't have it all spelled out. We don't, we, you, know, you, you can't build the flow chart <laughs> like you'd want to. Mm -hmm. But you get indications that there's something going on here. There's rank and there's hierarchy. There's differentiation in power and status and whatnot. Because, you know, look at, look at what Jude says and, and, and Peter. Look, even the angels don't dare bring railing accusation against the celestial ones. Mm -hmm. They know when they're outranked. Mm -hmm. Again, angel is just, it's a low ranking job description. And in the English term yeah. doesn't really convey the sense. No. There are different terms in the Hebrew and in the Greek that indicate different if you types just, If you just go ranks. back to divine council typology, <clears throat> and I discussed this in the unseen realm where you have you know, in the, in the biblical version, you have the triune God at the top. You have sons of God in the middle. And sons of God is, is, is a term that, that would be used in ancient Near Eastern royalty for sort of the inner circle, the family circle. You give the most important jobs to family members, again, for a whole no range of reasons. And then the rest of the task force, the rest of the household, are just errand people. Mm -hmm. You know, they're staff people, messengers. And mm -hmm. that's actually what malach, angel, angelos means. Mm -hmm. So angel's actually a job description. It's a thing that a, a given divine being is tasked to do. Take a message, receive a message, whatever it is. But the big boys, okay, the ones that get the jobs that matter, okay, governing territories, are not them. They're sons of God. They're, they're the second level underneath mm. the head. So a lot of that thinking, that royal household thinking, is where this terminology comes from in the Old Testament that gets applied to the hierarchy of the unseen realm. Mm. To an ancient person, they would have, they would have understood this you know, transparently. Yeah, I remember when, when I was growing up in a Baptist church, you know, we were always taught that the rebellion happened, you know, thousands of years ago and it's done all done and over with and whoever's chosen sides. But the, the more that I look into the Bible and do these kinds of studies on angels and demons, um, I'm not so sure if it was just one event that happened and it just doesn't happen anymore. So I wanted to ask you, can angels still fall even today? Well, I, th I think, I think the answer to that is yes. And I base it on a couple of comments in Job. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are certainly divine rebellions. There's an, a single entity that rebels in Genesis 3. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of entities that rebel in Genesis 6. You know, there, in, when you get to the Babel event, you have, again, sons of God who are supposed to be working for Yahweh, supposed to be loyal to him, part of his heavenly host. They get appointed and they go astray mm -hmm. okay, in Psalm 82. Jo in Job, it says you know, two times that, that the Lord Yahweh does not trust his holy ones. Now, you could read that. It's Job 15, Job chapter 4. You, know, you could read that and say, well, that's hindsight. You know, God knows that, you know, well, they, they mess up because, hey, you know, they, yeah, they're really intelligent, they're smart, they're like, they're like God, but they don't have his nature, so they mess up. Mm. You could read it that way, or you could read it as more of a declarative statement. God doesn't trust them because he does know that this has happened. Mm -hmm. There's no promise that it will never happen again. In other words, he knows he has to keep his eye on them because... They're, they have free will. That's one of the, the communicable attributes. And 
they can do what they do, and they've done it before. So I, I don't think that the door is closed on that. Hmm. Yeah. We just have a couple of minutes left, but I, you mentioned The Portent, which we sh I should have been uh, pointing out all along at the beginning of the program, is one of your novels, uh, the follow-up to The Facade, which mm -hmm. uh, basically follows the same storyline, same protagonist. Um, you mentioned Fern and Audrey, and mm -hmm. uh, they were guests on the Naked Bible podcast some time back, and mm -hmm. uh, they described an incident, and again, with just a couple of minutes to go, where they encountered a high-level spiritual entity, mm -hmm. uh, and it was not it was not as easy to remove as the ones that they had encountered in the past. Mm -hmm. You just, with a couple of minutes, share that uh, that encounter and how they finally got it to go. Yeah, yeah. They, they uh, again, they're not they're not exorcists. They're not deliverance ministers. Most of what they do is is evil done to people by other people. But occasionally they run into something more. And this was an episode where they. You know, they told me we we just tried everything that, that we thought would work. We quoted scripture, we sang songs, we you know did this, that, and the other thing. And she said, finally, it it, it or he started to act out. You know, kind of you know like, are we in trouble here? You know, or is something going to happen to us? You know, they they felt that they were really in harm's way, and so they literally used the the language, you know, of of Jude and said, the Lord rebuke you, watcher. Hmm. You know, they, they instead of instead of the of a celestial one, mm -hmm. which is the Jude language, they they swapped in watcher because mm -hmm. she said that's all I could think of, and that line is from the book. Right. That's a, there's, there's a critical there's a, there's a scene, scene in, in the book where where there's there's someone who is is absolutely defenseless because they're they're a quadriplegic in the book, but this guy is sort of the spiritual center, and and he he dispatches. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, 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 he's totally dependent on God because he's got nothing else. And he says, I know who you are. I've seen your kind before. You know, the yeah. Lord rebuke, you know, watcher. And he, he names him. And, and that was just it. You know, Fern and Audrey said he just threw a fit and sat down. <laughs> yeah. And that, was, and that was that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But don't underestimate and don't ever try to engage on your own power. Dr. Michael Heiser is the author of The Unseen Realm, Recovering the Supernatural Worldview of the Bible. Mike, fascinating as always. Josh Peck, host of Into the Multiverse, one of the web exclusives of Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert. Thank you for watching as we keep watch. This is Skywatch TV.